Hello? I don't hear you. I'm mute. I was muted. You hear me now? I do, I do. Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. How are you? Baruch Hashem, uh, David Arnon, right? Yes. In person, so to say. <laughs> That's right. Very nice, very nice. <clears throat> where's our uh, where's our partner in crime? The anti tails guy, uh, Dove, K Dove Kagan. That's the guy. Oh yeah, actually, I was actually I know it. I know the family. Uh huh. Um, I was conversing with his brother in high school, actually. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> How these in Toronto? Cold. Yeah. How are things in Chicago? Windy, right? Uh yeah, it's not so bad. It's like in the forties. Not, so not, bad. not terrible. Not terrible. In here. I think it got colder in the New York area. Oh yeah. yeah. Telling you, we got to thank Al Gore for this. You know, uh, March weather's late. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's over here. It snowed. It hailed. It snowed again. Oh really? Our weather has been it rained this morning. It hasn't been. Uh, it hasn't been so bad. Yeah, they, they predicted a few days ago that was going to be like a polar vortex of some sort. Yeah. It hasn't gone that bad, but that's what that's like they were they were predicting, you know, it was going to be like a major change in weather. And that's that in that respect, they got it right. Yeah. Well, usually, usually they say you shouldn't plant things until after the middle of May. So sometimes yeah. the middle of May gets cold. Yeah. How are you liking the group, by the way? As far as. It's very interesting. Uh, you're, I don't know where you find all this stuff. It's amazing. Um, Google. I don't know. <laughs> no, it, it's there's a lot of information that's uh that's very useful. So I'm Google, enjoying Google, it. Google and a lot of personal phone calls. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have so much time to work on this. It's amazing. I really don't have time. That's that's a joke. <laughs> I really really don't have time for it. It's just you know I mean I mean I I make the time. It's one of those things. You know it's like. It, um, but it's nice. You know, there are a lot of people looking for information, so it's a good place to find information, you know, and to talk about things, discuss like different sheetos and stuff. It's very like I wouldn't have known all these different things. Yeah. Yeah. Discuss to discuss different sheetos and um, and not only that, but also um, also a lot of people are like, why doesn't why doesn't this rabbi wear it? Weird? Why doesn't that rabbi rabbi wear it? Sort of a straw right, yeah. man. But this is what this is what we do. So what I say, bring on the straw man. Right. Oh, Dove Kagan's up. Oh, Shalom Aleichem. He's also muted. Hey. Uh, Shalom Aleichem, Dove. Shalom Aleichem, Shalom. Hey, Dove, how are you? No response. How's Yitzchak doing? Wait, is that David? It is. Hi, David, how are you? Baruch Hashem. How's Yitzchak? Yitzchak's doing well. Hey, good. Send my regards if you speak with him. Will do. This is Rafi Hefs. How are you? Sorry, my, my thing broke up. What's going on? So this is Rafi Hefs. How are you doing? Baruch Hashem, how are you? Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Yeah, I, was, uh, I was just asking David, I'll ask you the same. Uh, how are you enjoying the group so far? Uh, pretty good. I can't say I've had too much time to go into it. I've been somewhat busy. I have okay. to give classes all night to good boys in America because of Corona, but... Uh... Yeah, I know. Yeah, listen, uh, listen, I, I was, listen. We're all busy. As as I was just telling David, you know, he's uh, he asked me like, where do I find the time to 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 get all this information? What have you? I'm like, I really don't have the time. <laughs> it's one of those things that's like, even if you don't have time, you find the time. Where I don't know. Yeah, Oh, Yehudazan. Hi, everybody. I'm just trying to figure out the last. Shalom Aleichem. Nice to see you all. Thank you for, for joining. I'm uh, just trying to get the last few seconds of, uh, of pasting out the link to whoever wants to join us and last minute stuff. So just hang tight with me. Dove, I'm so excited you're here. What? By the way, I see that this is yep. recording. Please share the video after, uh, after uh, a, link, a link on the group or something. 
Definitely. We're doing it. Wait a second. Let me do this. Just give me a second. Oh, this also streaming on YouTube or only on uh, Zoom? It's on Zoom and Facebook, and Bez is Hashem. We're going to take the video that is recorded and upload to YouTube. That is the plan. Unless, of course, Dove manages. Unless Dove is going to rip me to shreds that, too, uh, too hard. And then we... <laughs> I'm not here to rip you to shreds. I'm here to listen. <laughs> I'm going to wait till your rebuttal share. That's a session. Um, that will be for a different time. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing my face. Kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> going on the Facebook Zoom uh, thing. Terrific. Okay. One more second, please, and then we'll be ready to start. All right. Shalom alaykum, everybody. Um, Hi, Ginsburg. The, it's being streamed to the Base of the Pilsner um, account on Facebook. It's also shared to the Tchelos Facebook page. I just want to make What's sure going on? this is working. Ah, Rabbi Yeshua. Wow, what a, what a special surprise. Yeah, what a special Shalom. surprise. Nice to meet you. Oh? Pleasure. Didn't have a video? Didn't have video there? Oh, there you are. How are you doing? Shalom Aleichem, Yeshua. All right, we're about to start. What's going on over here? Fill me in. Pleasure. We're giving a share on Tcheles. So you can, you can, you oh, can wow. let us know that we actually know your... Uh, we can actually know that uh, that we know our stuff. All right, I'm going to ask everybody to please mute their microphones, yes. and um, we're going to get started. Okay. Can um, Shmuley, can you uh, can you um, mute everybody? Terrific. Can everybody see my screen? All right, thank you for making me a host. Um, all right. So first disclaimer is, this, of course, that um, while I originally planned on giving this on, on actual keynote presentation, um, this um, the, there was, it was too many glitches. So I had to convert it into a PDF. But there are a few videos that I do want to show you. So I'm going to eventually show them to you. We're just going to sort of play around with it and make sure that everybody's able to see and be able to watch and be able to follow through. Um, so that's the technical, that is the technical um, preview, Hakdama. And one second here, I'm just going to hide the thumbnail. All right. Wait, go here, resize window. Let's move this out. All right. Wait, where's the show? Yeah, most people aren't in. Um, yeah, that's him, that's him. 
Yeah, that's his wife, but that's him. Well, he his video was on before. He was saying hi, but he left. Okay, one second. Everybody, please mute themselves. Mute all. Perfect. Continue. Perfect. Okay. All right, we're ready to start. So, the first thing... Let me just figure out how to... Let me just turn off... Let's start this again. Sorry, we're technical difficulties as usual. Um, hang tight, please. All right, let's share our screen and here we go. All right. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome everybody to the Shear on the rediscovery of Tcheles. This is part one of the Shear. Tonight we're going to be discussing um, and we're going to try to discuss exactly what is the requirements for Tcheles, what is considered a Chilazan, Alpi Halacha, how we can identify Chilazan, can we possibly identify the Chilazan, um, and why um, Rabbi Yitzchak Halevi Herzog, Rabbi Isaac Herzog, the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, decided that the Murek Shrunkulus was actually the proper candidate for the Chilaza. Now, of course, a disclaimer here, we're not here to tell anybody to yes wear Tcheles, to not wear Tcheles. We're here to learn a sugya, to discover that, uh, to see, is there merit to those who say that Tcheles has been found? And can we potentially pinpoint using the resources that we have, be it Makaris through Chazal, um, and other curious if we can pinpoint and exactly to know what is uh, chilazen and by extension how we can wear tchilas. In this, in part one, as I mentioned, we're going to look through the actual hakdama, the start of the share. Is there what to even discuss? And in part two, we're going to go through some of the questions against the tchilas, um questions such as nignas, lack of misayra, and all those other things. And we will also t- touch on uh, the sugya of if one should be wearing tchelis, how many strings should one wear, and how should it be tied. Uh, that will be in part two, which will be next week. Let's jump right in. There is uh, a mitzvah de raisa to wear tchelis on our tzitzis. It says, V'nasinu al tzitzis hakonof besil tchelis. A pasuk in the Torah, which tells us that one is required to wear a psil tchelis on their tzitzis. Well, how can we know how to wear tchelis if we um, if we don't know what the requirements for tchelis are. So let's take a look. The there are three halachic requirements that we find in Chazal for and then in the Rishonim and the Poskim for tchelis. The first halachic requirement is as follows: the source of the tchelis dye must come from a chilazin. That's number one. If we would have a dye that we would call tchelis that came from something that is not classified as a chilazin, it would not be kosher. The makar for this is the Tesefta and the Yerushalmi Mitzvah Tzitzis. The requirement, the second requirement to wear Tcheles, in order for something to be kosher for Tcheles, is that this Tcheles dye has to be a blue color. If we would potentially find a creature called Chilazin and be able to make a red dye, one would not be, it would not be considered a kosher uh, pair of Tcheles. One would need it to be a blue color. And the third requirement that Chazal give us is that the Tcheles dye must also remain strong and not fade over time. We're going to go through each one of these Makaras separately um, in a second. But there are no other requirements are men- that are mentioned by Chazal or the Rishayinim for Tcheles to be considered kosher. Therefore, it is safe to assume that, and this is an assumption, granted it's an assumption, but they're safe to assume that being that the Gemara and the Rishayinim and the don't mention any other requirement for Tcheles, therefore we can assume that there is nothing else that would be required for Tcheles, otherwise they would have told us about it. Everything is gone mute.
Is it frozen for everybody else? Just me. Yeah, it was frozen for like for like 20, 30 seconds. Can you yeah. go back to requirement requirement number one just so that we can uh, all be on the same page? I'm still frozen. Uh, is Yehuda still there? No, he disappeared. Hold on, we're trying to get him back. Okay. Are we back, everybody? Did we lose me? We lost you for a sec. Can you start from the beginning? Sorry about that. Sure, definitely. Where did you lose me? Uh, I think point number two. So can you start from point number one just so that we can... Uh... Okay, we'll start. Yes, okay, definitely. We'll start from again. Let me uh, jump in to, the sh uh, to, uh, to share my screen. Again. Here we are. And... Let me just make sure to go back. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. So, as we mentioned, in order for there to be a, in order for us to know how we can be Mekayim in the mitzvah of wearing Tcheles, we would need to be able to look at the requirements that Chazal give in order for Tcheles to be kosher. So, what would those requirements be? The first requirement is that the source of the Tcheles needs to come from a Chilazim. Therefore, if it doesn't come from a chilazin, assuming that we could find a creature that is not a chilazin, but would produce a dye that we would call tcheles, that would not be kosher, the makar is the tesefta and, and the, and the yushami mitzvah tzitzis. The second makar, the second requirement that is required by, uh, by chazal for tcheles is that the tcheles dye has to produce a blue color. If we were to find a, a kosher chilazin that would produce a red color, for example, that would not be kosher for tcheles. Number three, the tcheles dye has to remain strong and not fade over time. If it were to fade over time, it would not be kosher. So even if we could find the chilazin, whatever this chilazin, this creature called chilazin is, and we would then find the chilazin that can produce a blue color, but it would not re remain strong and it would fade over time, it would not be considered a kosher, kosher for tcheles. There are no other requirements that are found in Chazal or the Rishayin for Tcheles other than these three. Okay, let's just say, we have to remember that for a large portion of our history, from the beginning of Bayes, from, from the giving of the Torah till, till the end of Bayesheni, everybody wore Tcheles on their tzitzis. So we could be safely, uh, we could safely assume that the that the halachas that were put down for tcheles were well known to the people. And these are the only requirements that we find throughout our, uh, throughout the Gemara and the Rishayinu. So therefore, it's safe to assume that there are no other requirements in order to make something kosher for tcheles. It needs to have the following three things. It needs to come from a chilazim, it needs to be blue, and it needs to remain strong and not fade over time. Let's take a look. Source number one. The Tesefta says, If one would bring it from uh, a creature that is not Chilazin, it's not it's possible. Similarly, the Gemara Masech Tzitzis says, Very clear. Source number two. The, uh, the Tcheles dye should produce a blue color. Well, the Makar for this is the Gemara and Chulun. How do we what what differentiates tcheles from any other dye? Tcheles is similar to the sea, and and the sea is similar to the to the heavens. So the Gemara in Chulin is telling us clearly that tcheles is similar to the color of the sea which is a bluish color. 
And also, it's similar to the color of the sky, which is also a bluish color. The Rambam codifies this in, in Helchus Titus, Perik Beis Halacha Aleph. Very clear description of what tcheles is. And number three, that the tcheles dye must also remain strong and not fade over time. This is the Rambam, same place. And it should not change. Okay, so we clarify there are three requirements by Chazal for a for Tcheles to be kosher. Well, let's see if we can identify the first and most important one. What is a chilazin? Something that is brought that is from a, 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 a without the chilazin, we have no starting point. So, can we identify what a chilazin is? Well, in 1919, in 1913, the first chief rabbi of Eretz Yisrael. Uh, Isaac Halevi Herzog wrote uh, his doctoral thesis where he created a word called perf uh, perforology, which is a made up name, uh, made up word. Uh, thank you, Shayan Kellitz, for, for that piece of information. And he identified, he wrote a whole thesis identifying that the Chalazin of Chazal, it was the Murex trunculus um, snail. Why did Rav Isaac Levi Herzog think that the Mirak Shankulis was a candidate? Well, in order for us to understand that, we have to understand a few things. Number one, the word chilozin, what does it mean? Where do we find it? Is it Lashon Kodesh? Well, the first time we find the word chilozin anywhere in our, in our Torah is in Mesechtis Kalim, in Mishnais, Mesechtis Kalim, Perik Yud, uh, Perik Yud Beis, I believe, Mishnah Aleph, where it says, if you were to tie this thing called Chilaz and Bereisha to Mea, if you were to tie this door knocker that was called Chilaz, uh, it, it would make the door considered a Kali enough that you would and then be able to be a Tama. So what is this word Chilaz? We don't find it previously in Tanakh. We don't find it at all. So let's take a look. The word chilazain is the word in Arabic halazun and in Syriac halazuna. Now, I am no uh, professional Svardi, so I definitely mispronounce uh, that. But let's take a look and we'll see that in an English Arabic dictionary, snail is translated as chalazun. And as a matter of fact, if you were to go ask any Arab on the street, what is a chalazun? They will point to you to snails. Same for Syriac, which I forgot to mention is modern day Aramaic. So we're starting to see that, of course. Yeah, I just want to add that, that in Farsi, the actual word is chilazon in Farsi, just as an aside. Okay. Even a Semitic language. Yeah. That they actually say, use the term chilazon in that, in, in that language. That's amazing. Thank you very much for, for sharing with that. So here we find that in the Mishnayis, we're finding the word chilozin or chalazun, which is actually, if you see in the Mishnayis that we have over here, we have it um, in, with its nikud in this manuscript, it's chalazun, which is not chilozin, but chalazun, similar to the Arabic and the Syriac. And as you just mentioned, um, I think uh, in Farsi. But it is, a, it is translatable into English as snail. The Aruch translated it the same way. He writes, Chilazin, Miloshin Arvi Vesuri, from Arabic and Syriac, Harishon Ba'arvi Chalazuna, Vuhushim Koilo Lechol Bale Harnitar. So it's a general term for any snail. Okay, so we're starting to see that in order that this creature Chilazin is a general, is, is a snail. Now, is it, can it be any snail? We'll find out. But first thing that we're seeing here from the Aruch, who's telling us that this word chilozain, which is an interesting word that is not found in Tanakh, it's not found in uh, beforehand, is all of a sudden telling us that this word is actually an Arabic and Aramaic word that is called chilozain, which is a word term for snail. The Rambam in Perak in, in Pirisha Mishnais, also in Perak Yibes 
Aleph over there on the word Chilazin, he explains as follows. Chilazin, v'hu ke'in sadaf, also mi barzel, noilin bayis al daltais. It's a similar type of door knocker that they would use to lock the doors. V'oise at sadaf, this shell, hu at sadaf shel balchai hayomi hanukra chilazin. Is the same shape of a shell of a sea creature that is called chilazin. All right, the Rambam is telling us the same thing. Chilazin is a creature with a snail. The, the, the Rambam's Talmud, Rabbi Tanchum ben Rabbi Yosef Rishalmi, wrote a dictionary called Al Marsad Al Achpai, which was a which is a dictionary translating all the different words that the Rambam uses that don't that are not Lashon Kodesh. And here he writes as follows: Chilazin. He's quoting the he's quoting the magic who alachzun ba'arvi, which is this creature alachzun in Arabic gamkein. The targum Yerushalmi Yerush Hatziltzel Yisrach Chalzuna Avodam Chilozin should say by Atchelis who gamkein min min hachilozin domei aser. Here he's writing as well that the dam chilozin that was used to dye the Atchelis is one of these min called chilozin. So that we're so far learning that chilozin is not necessarily one creature, but a general term for a species of creatures. Now, this is no great shock. If you ask any, if you ask my little three-year-old what a chilozin is, he'll very happily point you to the snails that are crawling around after a rainfall here. To him, this is no great shock. This is what is called a chilozin. Um, but for those of us who did not grow up in Eretz Yisrael, um, we always were we always were led to believe that the Skilazin is some sort of mystical creature, not unlike the uh, you know the Leviathan or some other some other type of creature that we you know we just don't know what it is. But it seems pretty clear that those who speak, as Rafi mentioned before, the Semitic languages, Chilazin is a pretty well known term, which was referred to which is referring to snails. Now we have a slight problem. The Gemara in Menachas, when talking about Chilazin, says. It's similar to a fish, which careful reading and a good yeshiva upbringing would teach us that its shape, its its shape is not, it, it's not is it is not an actual fish. It's similar to a fish. However, the Rambam, when he talks about this chilazin, calls it a fish. Chilazin v'hu dag. It is a fish. So which one is it? Is it a fish or not a fish? We can see a very, very practical uh, difference here. If it's a fish, then it cannot be a snail. And if it's a snail, then it can't be a fish. So which one? Is, so if this chilozin is a snail, then how does it match up with the Rambam? Well, the Graal has a, the same question, and he answers it as follows. This is the Graal in Pirish Mishnayis, in Kalim Perik Yudbeis, a Mishnah Aleph, and he says, Kol Shebayam. Anything that lives in the sea, min daku, is called a fish, called a moshi yilai. Doesn't matter the shape that it has. So therefore, it would not bother the gra why the Ram calls it a fish, whereas the Gemara, which is being much more accurate here, says it's similar to a fish. Similar to a fish, meaning it's not an actual fish by its open term, but it looks like a fish, and which we'll, which we'll, get, which we'll deal with in a few minutes. But the fact that the Ramam calls it a fish explains that it's a sea creature, which would then match up with the fact that, as we saw, the Ramam himself calls Kilozain the, uh, the Arabic word for snail. This is not a unique, uh, this is not unique to this situation. The Rabbi ibn Ezra, when explaining what Makas uh, Tzifardeya is, he says that it was crocodiles. It wasn't frogs, as we uh, all, all uh, grew up knowing, rather, it's a it, it's a crocodile, but he calls it mindag nimtza b'mitzrayim yikr b'loshin arab al timsach, which is a crocodile. But there he calls it a fish as well. It's a type of a fish, and this is not unique to Judaism or a Torah Torah thought. Even the Ksais Oxford Dictionary, for those who like uh, secular sources, when uh, under the word fish, it says any animal living in water. Um, hold on one second here. Well, Oh, I get my daughter here who's crying. Hold on. Very professional indeed. All right. 
where were we? So it's not, uh, it's not any, uh, it's not, uh, what we see from here is that this idea that calling something that lives in water a fish and not limited to a physical uh, 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 creature that it has an anatomy of a fish, anything that it lives in water can be classified as a fish. Okay. Moving forward into why Isaac Alevi Herzog identified the Murex trunculus snail as the candidate for the chilazim. The Pasuk tells us, For the 40 years that Kali Yisrael traveled in the Midbar, they did not change their clothes and their footwear did not wear out. So the Pasuk the of Kahana explains, Did they not grow? Just as this snail, just as it grows, its, snail, its shell grows with it. Says, do they not need to wash your clothes? My son, that a cupboard would wash your clothing. That means uh, one of the characteristics of this chilazin that we're seeing in the Psikta is that its shell grows with it. Over here, we have a picture of the Miric Shrunculus in various forms of its growth. And as you can see from the top to the bottom, the shell definitely grows with it, which would explain that this chilazin is something that has its shell growing with it. Another proof that Rav Isaac Levi Herzog came up with. Rashi takes it a step further. Rashi says, also, he quotes the Medrash. Rashi explains, first, that Anani covered wash your clothing, and that, would, uh, that explains why it stayed fresh. But even the smallest ones amongst the Bnei Yisrael, their clothes grow with it, like the lavush of a chaymet. Now, this is interesting, because chaymet is the Hebrew word for snail. So we're seeing that Rashi, when quoting the, the psikta, which uses the Aramaic word chilazain, instead translates it to chaymet as, the, as a snail. But we have a little bit of a problem here. Can we, please, can everybody please mute their microphones? Thank you. We have a little bit of a problem here. So far, we identified the chilazin as a snail. It seems pretty straightforward. But when Rashi in Sanhedrin refers to the chilazin, he translated it as a telas, a worm. Chilazin. So all of a sudden, we're seeing that maybe it's not a snail, maybe it's a worm. And the Rav Yoh says similarly, and the Rash and also the Ravid says, So here we see Chilazin is a Telas. Well, how do we reconcile that with the fact that we know that Chilazin is a snail? Well, if we take this picture over here, we can start to see that what is a snail? A worm with a shell. So, so far, Rashi is not a steer at all. Rashi is just matching up to everything we're saying so far, which is that Chilozin is a snail. He calls a chaymet in the previous slide we saw. But also, in another way to describe it, is the telas, which is a worm, that if you would remove the snail from the shell, it would be classified as a worm. Another sorry, proof. Sorry, you mind if I interrupt a sec? Sure. Um, if it was if it was just a pure talas, a pure worm, how could it be used as a doorstop? That's Great. why it can't be a pure worm. That's correct. But the point uh, the point that I was that I was showing was, which is a great point that you just brought up, is that if we're we have to take everything, what you're bringing up is that you have to take everything, all the ideas that we have about chilazin, and then match them all up. But I'm I'm pointing I'm pinpointing into it, even if you would just take it by that one point alone, by just the fact that it's called the telas, you would still be able to uh, to fit that into a description of a snail by just explaining that a telas. Remember, it needs to be a chilazin that can produce a blue a blue dye that doesn't fade. So if you can find me another worm, then maybe we can start a discussion. But even still, Rashi's not telling us that it could be any worm. Rashi's telling us that this chilazin is a worm, but not that worms are a chilazin. Rashi's just saying that chilazin is a telas. And how do we understand his description that it's a telas? 
by by showing us with the picture that we saw before that a that a um, a snail is by extension a worm with a shell. Another raya that we have is that when we uh, that a chilozin is referred to by Rashi as limza limes in French. Rashi in Chulin says chaymet a snail. Chaymet is Hebrew for snail. Lashon kodesh for snail. Limza he translated it as limza. Shetchilas briyase bechadasha it starts off very small. Tzei ubadik b'tikshela shagadu v'helach ima b'tchilase bechadasha. Similarly, Rashi in Abu Dazar says, Mishkide Chalzuni, Limits, Belaz, Min Chilazin. So here we saw Chaymet and Chilazin. Same words, one in Lash and Kredesh, one in Aramaic and Arabic, as we as we mentioned before, translating it as Limits, which is French, as we'll see. Rabbeinu Gershom says also, Chilazin, current Belaz, Limits. Here we have Google Translate. Now, to be fair, Limas, I think it's pronounced in French, but I'm no, I don't speak French. So I can forgive me. Anybody, any Canadians here who want to correct me or or people from France, I want to correct uh, correct my pronunciation. Feel free to do so. Limas, Limas, Limas. Thank you. Limas, probably. Right. Limas, Limas literally means a slug. But but what's interesting? Right. Sorry, sorry. What I want to add that's interesting is that in Italian, which is somewhat related. The word for snails mm-hmm. is lumaca, lumaca, which is very similar to, to the moose. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, they're both from Romance languages. They probably come out of the Latin. Probably comes from the Latin initially. Yeah. Look so, at the Latin; it's probably the root of it. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. So what we have here is is that limas. I think as as I was just correct. Thank you, whoever whoever jumped in. I didn't see who it was. Um, Limas is the old French word. The old French word, as we know, is, as we can see from Rashi itself, it's referring to straight up as a snail. But in modern French, it's referring to a slug. If you would put in limas into Google Translate, as I attempted to do, um, I got slug in English. But in Hebrew, I got shavlul, and shavlul, one of the translations, according to Google, by shavlul to English is a snail. So it's definitely within the same framework. Um, whether the new translation, the old translation, clearly Rashi is uh, telling us that limates, which is a word he uses uh, tra- to translate both for chaymet and for chaylosim, is referring to uh, limates, which, as we said, is referring to a snail. So to, to summarize what we have so far, chaylosim is a snail. How do we know? Well, as we mentioned, Arabic, Syriac, and as Rafi jumped in with Farsi, we have Rambam, or Tanchon, and Yerushalmi. They both call it openly as the that chilozin is its, its roots are in Arabic, which is um, the word for snail. It's a general term for snail. We saw that Rashi called it a telas, which we explained was a, uh, a snail as a worm with a shell. And we saw that its shell grows with it. And Rashi calls it openly limit. So until this point, uh, Rabbi Isaac Halevi uh, Herzog's thesis is, is going swimmingly well. Everything seems to match up that Achilazin is a snail. So, okay. so since Achilazin is a snail, therefore he identified it that it must be the Miric Shrunculus for other reasons, as we'll explain soon on. But we have one problem. And Dove Kagan, this is for you. We have one serious issue with everything we set up until this point. We have the Brysa in Menachas. The Bryce tells us as follows. Its body is similar to the sea. Ubriyasa and its shape is similar to a fish. And it rises up onto the water once every 70 years. And from its, from its lifeblood or uh, from its blood, we, we die. Therefore, its value is very high. So we can attempt, maybe with a little bit of an imagination, to try to figure out how we can match this brysa with everything we said before. But it would definitely be like my father likes to call it a shoehorn pshat, where we're trying to stick, stick our, our translation of a chilozin being a snail into this brysa. It's going to be pretty hard to do. A snail that's body similar to the sea, that looks like a fish, it's hard to say that that's talking about a snail. So how can we reconcile this? 
Well, let's take a look. With the following Akdama, I think we can understand this, Bryson. If we were to lose our Messiah for what the Dal and Minim are in Suk, uh, uh, that we use on Sukkot, and we would just use the available Gemaras that, de that describe the Dal and Minim, we would have a very hard time pinpointing a Lulav as a Pomfron, a Esrig as, as, um, as a Citron, and Hahadas as a, as a Myrtle, um, and uh, Anarava as a Willow. Let's just take a look at the Gemaras. For example, the Gemara in Sukkah, Daphnim Hay on the Bay, says, when describing a Lulav, it says, Rabbi Levi Aimer, Katamar. So one of the characteristics of a tamar is that it has a lave. Okay, so let's take a look at all the plant, all the plants, all different types of of tamar, and can we find something that has a a, a heart? Well, there is something called date a date palm, uh, uh, the heart of the heart of the 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 heart of the palm. I think I'm getting confused here, but. The uh, there is something that would be a, a date a date palm has a heart, and if you remove the heart, you it will it will it will cause the tree to die. That is for sure. Yeah, when I want to give the share palm. some in LA, <laughs> hearts of palm, yeah. Um, I get a share in LA, and someone who actually works with trees, he fought with me a lot on this afterwards, saying we for sure be able to pinpoint it because it's the only thing that has a heart. So maybe he's correct in that. But if we were to take the next Gemara that we have here. And so and hey, and we tried to find a, a esrig that has a chaitmai that has a nose, and we start looking for all sorts of fruit that have a nose, we'd have a hard time saying that it's a citron. Maybe it's a pear, maybe it's some other pointy fruit. I'm not saying that we wouldn't be able to find it. I am saying that it's going to be hard to understand. Uh, we would be we'd have, we'd be hard to be able to say with pinpoint accuracy that that's what it is. And also when it comes to the hadasim, that it's a shalshelis. So many different types of, uh, of uh, types of branches have shalshelis in them. So why do, why do these gemaras make sense? What am I trying to get here? The fact is, is that we know because we have a Messiah, because we have, since the Torah was given, that we, were, we, are, we take a, a lul of Esther, Kadas, and Arava, we know exactly what those are. Now we could appreciate these gemaras so much more. Now that we know that these Gemaras are referring to these Dal and Minim, so we can really appreciate it. We can see that the, that the, the palm frond that comes from a date palm, it has a lave, so it makes the Gemara sound very, very, very beautiful. And we can take an Esrg and we say it has a Chaitim, we can understand its nose, and we can see the, the Hadassim with the Shalshelis. But assuming we didn't know what these were, we would have a hard time pinpointing what they are. Now that we know, we can appreciate the, the, the lessons that the Gemaras are, are learning out from the specific Pratim that are said. Why am I bringing this in? Because when Chazal tell us that Brisa and Menachas, we have to remember that everybody knew what a Chilazin was. It wasn't a secret at the time. We today don't necessarily know what a Chilazin is. So we're trying to use whatever we have to sort of figure it all out, to try to say, okay, let's try to figure out what is a chilazin, and we're trying to understand this b'risa, and we're reading it, Mechatesi, it's talking about the uh, Osnail, who says, but to the people that lived at the times of the Gemara, when the Gemara was written, when that b'risa was taught, nobody found it strange that it didn't match up with the snail. They all, uh, they all saw exactly how it can match up with a snail, because they all knew what it was. And let's take a look, word for word, what it is. So does this mere shrunkulus here look like similar to the C? Mm, no, nah, not really. I don't think so. How about now? Take a look at this color and this color. This is actually a picture of the C in Achziv, which is taken right, off, right in the area where the snails are normally found. That would be one way to explain why it's Guvadem Liam, assuming that everything we said was, until this point was correct, that a chilozin has to be a snail. Well, when the Bryce is talking about kufa demiliam, it must be a snail that's similar to the sea. What is similar to the sea? We can potentially say the, al the algae that, that grows so that's on... Not, that's, the goof of this. that's just a shell. That's not a goof. That's not the snail itself. It's, it's, it's the shell. 
Oh, what is a snail? A snail is like it looks like a slug. I mean, it looks like a worm with, with horns on it. It's uh, you've seen them crawling in your garden or maybe up the side of your aquarium. They're not the right. uh, that's that's just the shell that it carries on its back. That's not the, that's not the okay. color of the actual worm. They're, so they're very often the, the, uh, the actual slug yeah. is a dark the dark the slug the, the ones that we see on the ground are dark brown, whereas their their their, their shells are usually a very light beige. So the, the, mm -hmm. the color of the shell doesn't match the color of the uh, of the worm itself. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Now let me ask you this: If you were to see a slug without a snail, if you were to see a worm without its shell or a snail without its shell, would you still say it's a snail? Sure. Of course. All right. I don't know. Not necessarily. I would say maybe it's a slug. Maybe it's something else. What defines a snail is the fact that it has a shell. Um, Do you disagree? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I don't think I don't okay. think a turtle. Is, Fair. I don't, think a, I don't Fair. Think, I think a turtle is not a turtle if it loses a shell. If someone removes the, the okay. shell from a turtle, I've never I don't seen think a turtle, turtle without, without a shell. No. I mean, no. I mean, if, so, okay. if someone Maybe. physically removes the turtle, so you still got the living animal inside the shell. It would die eventually. I, I understand that. I can understand 100% what you're saying. I'm just saying is when you look at something and you <laughs> want to define it and as a general term, it's usually everything that's encompassed in, that's that's encompassed in with it in with it. Okay, it's a good point that you're right, making. But if you just if you let's, just let's, let's, put it, let's take it let's take it, let's take it the other way for a second. If you took the shell mm -hmm. alone without the slug in it, would it be a snail? It would be a shell. It wouldn't be the snail though, right? That's correct. Okay, so, so I'm but saying a snail. Yeah. A, a snail is is everything, right? A snail it is, is, a snail a snail is a slug that's characterized by having it, by having a shell that it carries around with it. Very often, Correct. that slug is without a shell, and very often you find these shells without the slug. Is one which which is more to the snail, that the animal itself, the living animal, or the shell that it carries around. We're saying here in this I picture, think, I that think the shell both. looks like the sea, but not that the, that the animal looks like it. Yeah, the that the the, the okay. is extracted from the animal, not from the shell. Correct. That's correct, but it's also one thing it's one unit you'll see you'll see shortly but i don't know if you were here from right. were you here from the beginning of the share pretty much yeah okay terrific great so I just, for anybody who who joined us late i just want to clarify that we're we're right now working within the assumption that of isaac levy herzog brought that the muric shrunculus is the proper candidate for chilazin why because chilazin it means snail as we proved uh very thoroughly previously now we're mm -hmm. trying to reconcile the fact that we proved that a chilozin is a snail with the brysa and menachas that seems to, to show us that maybe it isn't a snail. We explained that at the time that the brysa was being taught, everybody knew that a chilozin was a snail. We're gonna match up exactly the, the we're, gonna, we're gonna match up how to appreciate the words of the brysa talking about something that everybody already knew what it was. So we can learn out what, it, what, 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 what we can learn from it. So as I mentioned, uh, can I ask, can I ask the whoever asked the question to explain why he would think that goof would refer to the part you can't see as opposed to the shell, which is the most visible part? I'm, I'm, I, can you can you explain your position why gufo should not apply to the shell? Sure, because the the the, the chelit is extracted from the body of the living of the animal that lives inside the shell, not not the shell itself. And therefore, if you take the shell by itself, you can't call that a snail. Not at least not that you can't call it the zone from which the the chelit is extracted. Does that make sense? I'm saying in describing an animal, you take the animal as a whole. So I'm wondering how you know to separate the two. That gufo has to refer to the to the slug and not to the whole animal. The the uh, the, the the animal itself, the, the, which what we sometimes see is a slug crawling in our gardens with other shell. That's the animal itself. Okay. It then that's creates it, it. Well, it's our slug, yeah. But it's it's, right. it's a snail. But the and it no, and it's it a slug. Like, okay. If it, if it looks like a snail and it walks like a snail that's like a snail it's probably a snail okay like a duck okay <laughs> so right. if you but the but the animal creates its own shell by has a certain excretion it creates a shell and makes it bigger and bigger or as as it as it itself grows it doesn't, it doesn't start off at that size it gets bigger and bigger you see tiny shells and then larger shells and whatever so it discards the shell and grows and grows a new one much like lobsters and, and, and crabs do. okay but the the lobster itself is identified most of the time by the shell that it's in, but it can actually come out of the shell. It sheds its shell and grows a new one through a certain excretion of its body. The same way with the snail. So you would describe so the a lobster. Shell is not the snail. 
you would describe a lobster as being white and not red? That's right. Well, first of all, it only, first of all, it's, it's dark, it's very dark green or, or brownish. It only turns red when it's boiled in hot water. So that's when it turns red. Um, but yeah, it's, if the lobster, is, I mean, you find, if you're swimming in the sea and you see a lobster, you're going to identify this as sort of the brownish thing on the ground. But when you eat a lobster, which I've done in the past, it's the white flesh inside. You don't eat, you don't eat the shell. You're not saying you're eating lobster when you're eating the shell. And if you have a surf and turf, you only have the white meat of the, of the lobster with the beef on the side. You don't have the shell at all. But you're still eating lobster. Right. Uh, okay. All right. Those of you who don't know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Terrific, guys. Let's let's uh let's try to uh, let's try to keep this. Uh, let's try to keep on. <laughs> let's try to keep moving on it. But everybody's making great points. Let's see if we can still at the end of everything. Let's see if we can still match things up, and we can definitely continue this conversation um, uh, 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 as we continue on with the shear. All right. So as we mentioned again, Chilas and Gufa Demeliam. One of the ways that we can potentially see how the Bryce is matching up with the snail is the fact that the snail has a similar color to the water color before it. But there's another way as well, which is that if when it's on the seafloor, it is very hard to identify. It blends in with the seabed very, very well. Now, as I mentioned before, I have a video that I wanna show you, but first thing I wanna show you is this. If we over, see over here, um, this, is the, this is the seabed and you can see over here, actual other shells that are very noticeable. And on the video I'm gonna show you in a second, you'll be able to see this in a very, a very clearly. But over here is a Murex trunculus and it's very, it blends in really well into the seabed. So I'm just gonna stop this share for a second and I'm gonna jump over to another share. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get the, uh, here's the video and I'm gonna play it for you now. Here we have a video this is in the days before GoPros had uh, had proper uh, stabilization. So try not to get dizzy. We can see over here all the different shells, but over here is a Murex trunculus. As it's pulled up, you can you can tell. I'm just going to go back for a second so we can see that again. Um, unless you know what you're looking at, it's very hard to find it exactly on the on the seabed. It it blends in really well. You can see all these other shells are really really easy to spot. And they're very easy to, to see, but, uh, but a Murex trunculus are much harder to find on the seabed. That potentially can explain, again, what the Gemara is referring to. Okay, just stopping the share and jumping back to the other, where is it? Here we go. Okay, continuing on. So, this next part of the Bryce, so Briyase Daimeladak. Rashi explains what does this mean that it's similar to a fish? It's Tavnas Diuknoi. Its actual shape is that of a fish. Now, Briyase, it's uh, Rabbeinu Gershom explains what Briyase is it's Tsurase, it's, it's shape. Now, we all saw the shape of the Mirak Shrunkulus before. And if you really use your imagination, you potentially can see with one type of fish how. The mirror trunk doesn't look like a fish, but it's a little bit hard to say that. So the the Arach though explains that it's fine. Doim ledak shel yam shu rachav. It's vedak v'chad klape roishe. It's wide but has a pointy head near its head. Now again, how do we understand this price? Well, if we understand, if, can everybody please mute themselves? Thanks. If we can understand that the brisa is talking about and everybody knows that the Bryce is talking about a snail, we can then understand that of all the snails that are available that live in the sea, only the Miric Shrunculus looks the closest like a fish. Again, it's not saying that it looks exactly like a fish. It's just saying that it happens to have the shape that is similar, most similar to a fish. Again, not, act, not perfect, but like I mentioned, if we were trying to, to pinpoint, um, if we were trying to pinpoint the uh, the lulav based on the gemaras so we'd also not be happy and we would not say it was perfect fit as well. What do we do with that? Rashi explains. Well, last I checked, the mirror shankulus doesn't rise from the sea every seventy year, once every seventy years. Well, how do we explain that? So the Advaz explains as follows. 
ובחלקו של זבולון הוא היה אוהל מאליו מן הים אל היבשה, הוא קם אופ from the sea to the dry land, והיו מלאכתם ישראל, they would collect it, ואחר שגולו ישראל לא היה אוהל. After כל ישראל was sent into exile, it no longer arose. So that would explain that the fact that the Miric Shrunculus doesn't rise up from the sea once every 70 years is not necessarily a problem, at least according to Radvas. Okay. So just a quick recap. We came out very clearly that a chilozen has to mean a snail. How did we reconcile with the Brysa? Um, some would find that reconciliation that I brought you know, plausible. Some would find it not plausible. But... If we understand with uh, that the that a chilozen is for sure a snail, that would be a, a, at least an attempt to understand how the brysa matches up with that. But now we're going to show, until this was just speculation, we just said, okay, we need to find the chilozen that produces a blue, a blue dye and that it produces a dye, blue dye that doesn't fade. Well, how do we know that the chilozen, maybe the mirkshrunculus, matches all three of those criteria, but wasn't the one that was used by Chazal? Well, we're now going to prove that uh, using nine proofs that the muric snail was actually the very same animal that was used in the times of Chazal. Let's go through it one by one. The dye sac is independent from the rest of its blood, as Taisus describes the chilozen of Tchelas, that is Mifgad Pocket. Number two, the murex dye is described as best when extracted while the snail is alive, as Chazal say regarding the chilozen of Tchelas. Number three, murex dye is identical in appearance to Kala Elon, with the exception that the latter can fade, precisely as Chazal tells us regarding Tchelas. Number four, the Greek name of the murex, Parpura, is used by Chazal and Rishonim to describe Tchelas. Number five, Acharinim explicitly identify the chilozen of Tchelas as the murex snail. Number six, Murex dying in the times of Chazal was widespread in the exact places that Chazal described the dying of Tchelas. Number seven, the Murex dye was extremely expensive as the Gemara says regarding Tchelas. Number eight, the dying process is exactly the same as Chazal described it. And number nine, the cessation of widespread Murex use parallels that of the cessation of Tchelas production. Okay, we're going to take them one at a time and we're going to see if the historical sources match up with the sources that we have in Chazal. Number one, the blood is contained in a separate pouch, Mifkat pocket. So here we have a close-up shot of the, of the Murex shrunculus. And you can see over here, if we crack the shell with a hammer, it doesn't hurt the, it doesn't hurt the animal. You hear you have the snail inside and you have this white vein. And for some reason, when you take a picture, it looks purple, uh, but usually it's a white vein um, that this vein alone is the only place that you, you pop this and it, I, a, a, a purple liquid pops out, uh, as I'll show you soon. And that's the only part that is used for trellis, not the, not the yellow part, not the rest of the body. As a matter of fact, you could pop this out and technically put it back into the sea and it potentially will continue to live. Um, the only reason why this pouch exists is to be used for, for dye. There is no other reason. Uh, marine biologists have not found any other reason why the snail needs this little pouch. Taisus, when describing the chilozin, says, It's in a separate pouch. Therefore, popping it will not cause it to die. Therefore, it's not a problem killing it on Shabbos. Of Chabur on Shabbos. Pliny the Elder says similarly, when describing the Murex shrunculus, which was used for this dye, he writes as follows. The Murex does the same. He quotes it by name. The Murex shrunculus, but the but the purple that ha, that ha, has that exquisite juice, which is so solidly great, uh, which is so greatly sought after for the purpose of dyeing cloth, situated in the middle of the throat. The secretion consists of a tiny drop contained in a white vein from which the precious li precious liquid used for dyeing is distilled. So, when Pliny, uh, which is clearly talking about the Murex, talks about that there was a little pouch inside it, um, and Tysus also mentioned had a pouch. Number two. Number two, the dye derived from the chilozin deteriorates after its death. Let's take a look. So here is a muric shunculus that we let that we let to die. Um, literally, we let it. Uh, we we left it out of water for a while, and it and it eventually died. And as you see, 
this purple liquid starts oozing out and it becomes extremely unusable, as I'll show you in a second. The Gemara and Shabbos, when referring to it, says the Kama de Isbe Neshama, that the Chilazin, whenever it, it's still alive, it's much more valuable. Because you want to use it for dying. Pliny, when referring to the Murex, tells us as well, it is a great point to take the fish alive. For when it dies, it spits out this juice, meaning it's no longer usable, this, this sack for dye. Aristotle says as follows, fishermen are anxious always to break the animal in pieces while it is yet alive, for if it dies before the process is completed, it vomits out the bloom. Basically, this pouch, this, this dye sack is no longer usable. Here we have taking, popping the, the, the uh, what's the name, the sack from a, from a dead murex and from a live murex. When it's live, it turns this deep, dark purple. A dead, you can see it's already much lighter and not as usable. Number three, the murex dye is identical to color elan. And this is a big proof. Let's take a look. What is Kali Ilan? So the Arach tells us that Kali Ilan is indico. And the Muki Yosef also calls it Kala Evan. V'yesh harbe balashin chachamim Ilan indi balas. V'chem apirish ba'arach indico. Indico. It's basically a plant that's found in the, Indian, in the Indian country that was used to create a blue dye, very similar in color to the Mirak Shankilis. The Gemara in Baba Metziah asked the following question. Amar Ravo, Lamali de Kasa Rachmana, Yitzias Metzayim Beribis, Yitzias Metzayim Gabe Tzitzis, Yitzias Metzayim Bemeshkalitz. Why does the Torah feel the need to warn us that Yitzias Metzayim by Tzitzis, by Ribis, and by Meshkalitz, by weights? Amar Kadish Baruchu, Ani Hushev Chanti Bemetzayim, Ben Tiba Shelbachar, Letiba Shena Shelbachar. I personally was not uh, uh, um, was able to differentiate between who was a Bechar and who was not a Bechar in Mitzrayim. Just as I was able to do that, I will take care, I will know who's not being truthful and is in, in, in uh, while, even though he pretends that he's not lending with Ribis, he actually is lending with Ribis, even though nobody else will know. And for someone who dips his weights in salt, which is un, which is not um, is not visible to the naked eye, and therefore he ends up um, charging more money because his weights are worth more, are heavier. And for the and also to someone who puts kala ilan on their clothing, on their tzitzis, and says that it's chelasu. Meaning that if we were to look at the, at someone wearing kala ilan and someone wearing tchelis, we would not be able to tell the difference. That's how similar they are, and they're actually very similar within the, the molecules of themselves. The molecule that produces the color for plant indigo is exactly the same as that of the Mirix dye. It is remarkable that this dye is so chemically similar to kala ilan that man cannot differentiate between them without a chemical test. What is this test? The Gemara Menachas tells us tchelis ain't labadika the ain't an element mumka. There's no way to check it. You only should buy from someone who's a mumcha. In fact, the Gemara of the in La Vedika does it not have a, a way to check? He found the whole test. He, he put it in, right? He stuck it in. There's a whole test. Basically, if it survived, then it was kosher. If it didn't, then it was possible. So there is a chemical test that can be done, but just by looking at it, one would not be able to tell the difference. This is what indigo looks like. And when Pliny describes it, he actually mentions that the murex is exactly, is so similar to indigo that there's one major difference. And I quote, we know too that from the plants are extracted admiral colors for dyeing. The people of Gaul beyond the Alps produce the Tyrian colors, the conculated and all other use by the agency of plants alone. They have not there to seek the murex at the bottom of the sea, nor have they to go searching in depths to which no anchor has penetrated. Standing on dry land, the people there gather in their dyes just as we do our crops of corn. Though one great fault is, uh, in them is that they wash out. Were it not for which, luxury would have the means of bedecking itself with far greater magnificence, or at all events at the price of far less danger. Pliny referring to the fact that there was a muric shrunculus dye that was very expensive and was dangerous to get. 
and the people from be, of Gaul beyond, beyond the Alps were able to produce the same colors, but with one great fault. They washed out exactly like the Gemara tells us about Kala Elam. Number four, the, mur- the name of the Murex, which is Parpura, is associated by Chazal with Tcheles and uniquely royal garments. Let's take a look. Historically, the Murex shellfish was called Parpura and was written about extensively. As we mentioned, Pliny, the other fish is known as the, pur- pur- the, as the Parpura or purple. Aristotle calls it the porphyry or purple murices gathered together to some one place in the springtime. It was a known commodity. The Pasuk tells us in Esther, When Mordechai left the palace of Achashverj after, uh, after Haman was killed, he left it wearing, wearing uh, kingly garments. What was one of those garments? The, and the Medrash tells us as follows, Mordechai became the king, the viceroy, on all the Jews. Maha Melech Levish Porphyrin, just as the king wears the special clothing called Porphyrin, Kach Mordechai Levish Porphyrin, the word Porphyrin. So here we see Porphyr and Tcheles are referred to the same creature or same type of garment. The Shemais Rabbah tells us that there is a, there, that when referring to the, 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 the Godim of the Kain Godol that was Tcheles, he would say, that there was a marshal, that was a king, he had to send out his son, and he was afraid that maybe people would attack the, the prince, not knowing who he was, so he put him with, he, he put on his kingly garments called porphyra, everybody would see it, and everybody would therefore be afraid that this person is obviously royalty because he's wearing this special royal garment called porphyra. The Gemara in Brachas asked the following question, and, even, and hopefully, even those who um, didn't make it that far in Davyomi at least got to this part. When we can see the difference between the trailer strings and the loven strings. You can see the difference between the colors trailer and karsi. Karsi is green. Here we have the, the manuscript of the Ravya, and he quotes the Yushalmi, the Garcinu Yushalmi. Ben Trelis the Karsi. Bain porphyrin u bain prisinin. Now, some, some people have this quote as uh, bain prifinin, which would, there would be no difference between porphyrin and prisinin, but this actual, we can see here from this manuscript, here's the samach. Bain porphyrin u bain prisinin. Vuhu me'il shakar belashin las porphyro. It's a coat that is called in, in, uh, in las, in uh, the language, in, in the general language, in Latin, I think, or in Greek, porphyro. The Aruch explains, karas, what is karas? What is this color, karas? Vayar kekarasan, pirish min seva yirakrak, targum karsinun, karasi, bishvil shem yirukin, ubalaz parsinu. So the Aruch is telling us that karasi is parsinun, and treles is porphyrin. The Medjish HaGodl says, avala orin or tachash milamata, the treles milamala, it had the the artachish on top and the trellis was on was uh, I'm sorry the artachish was on bottom and the trellis was on top. Velama shekain dark and shall melech porfiro shalehem trellis. They would wear this porfiro which is trellis. The the the, the medrash and bereishis rabbi tells us lazeshe ba shait elita malchus lefana rabbi shua imer shalach porfiro v'talke kadmiu. And the limude atzilis says kizen nikra porfiro de malka v'nikra beget trellis. The porfiro is called the trellis. So we see trellis and porphyro are interchangeable, which means that when the fact that the Murex truncus is called as porphyro, as, porfir, uh, as porphyro, seems to match up with all these marmukaimis. Number five, the chilazin is explicitly called porphyro by achreinim. The chavasyar, who lived in, this, in, the, uh, in the 1600s, explains, b'chidushim kasafti, the dam chilazin shabai tsevim trellis, this this dye that they would use from the chilozin, this dam chilozin that they would use to dye tchelis, in a blue, it's not blue, rak tseva porfor, shenasa mi dam dog, shenikra dam porfor. It was the color porfor that was made from this fish, the sea creature that was called the porfor. The shilte giburim, that lived also in the 1600s, he writes, ubilosh in yavan, in Greek, ritzayin elemer, remes hayam hanikra porfuro. He says it openly. He calls it the exact Greek name 
the perfura, which is what Miric Shrunculus is in Greek. Miric Shrunculus is Latin, um, and perfura is Greek. He says it openly. The Tayyafes Reim, on the Sefi Reim, that was printed in the late 1800s, writes as follows. So, Hach Chilazin, Shetzayve Midome Tcheles, Nikar Chilazin Adumi, Porfor Shneka. Those who speak Yiddish will know that Shneka is a snail. Number six, remnants of the Mirak's dying are found in precisely the same places that Tcheles was produced. Well, where, where was Tcheles found? The Pasuk tells us in Yecheskel, they're from Ia Elisha. Where is Ia Elisha? Cyprus. The Gemara in Shabbos tells us, These are those who trap the Chilazin. Where do they trap it? From the ladders of Tzor until Haifa, which would be in this area here. So if we would have this Thank you, Google Maps. If we would have this beautiful map of the coast of Eretz Yisrael over here and Cyprus, it would be in this approximate area is where the Chilazin is found. Here's beautiful Rosh Nikra, And we're going to see that the Yavitz is telling us that this is where it's found. The same words were written also by the Seferi Uma Sa'ilam. Kaisvi Yeshri Amadinis have a nimtza ball at Sarechaylam. Vizichru. Shaloi nimtza bemakim acher adok should save him bedom et chelas. Ki im bein shenei hamakayim et salalo. The only place that has been found, the only place that has been found um, to have chelas where the chelazin is found, that this creature that is used to find to die, to die to is down is between these places. What is Soma the Tzor? The Encyclopedia Judaica tells us that it's actually Rosh Nikra. That's why we have this beautiful picture. And the Sufre Umas Ha'elam, as the Yavitz mentioned, is also, here we see it clearly, Pliny the Elder writes, in Asia, the best purple is that of Tyre, which is Tzor. Pliny also writes, we come next to the city of Tyre at the present day, all her fame, is confined to the production of the murex and the purple. Yes, a subspecies, thank you, Dove, a subspecies is found in um, Greece. It's, uh, Gershom Meltzer says that even though it's not the same exact uh, min, it's still kosher with trellis, you could take that up with him. Um, but the ones, and the reason why it's actually, yeah, from what I understand, um, it's actually interesting to note that um, we would mine technically they would, uh, people would love to get the, the actual New York shrunk list from off the coast of Eretz Israel. However, it is illegal to fish for it. It's considered an endangered species and therefore it's not allowed to be mined for trellis use. That's why they used uh, other species off the coast of Greece and well, off of Cyprus. So only when Mashiach comes and Eretz Israel becomes a theocracy, then we can mine it with an Eretz Israel. Something like that. I mean, a bit of a joke, but uh, or. Or you can uh, you can hang out with the right people and go uh, fishing and hopefully you won't get caught. <laughs> hey, Maven Yovin. All right. So um, the places that were found, the, this is a picture of Teldar and Tel Shakamina, which is both located right right near Haifa. And as it says, <laughs> thanks, Dove. <laughs> Tell Shakamana, numerous Murex Shrunculus and Murex Brandis were found on the Tell. Complete and broken shells of all three species were found in undatable context about half a kilometer south of the Tell. So here we see that, um, here we see a historical source that's saying that there were thousands of archaeology of, of shells were found in archaeological digs in the very places that we've been mentioning all along from both secular sources and from, and from Torah sources. That this were the locations where the, this were mined, and they were both mined in the same place. So, meaning that what was what was being used here to produce whatever dye that was produced here was was exactly the, the Miric Shrunculus. Number seven, the dye of Tchelis was very expensive.
Is it me or did we just freeze? We froze. Let it go. One second, guys. I'm just trying to figure out why my computer stopped uh, stopped working. Hold on one second while I reconnect. My sincere apologies for all the for all the uh, technical difficulties here. Where did I lose you, by the way? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Where did I lose you? Uh, the last, the last slide that we were at was the, the with with the uh, Tel Shikmona. So we're gonna Tel Shikmona, here. okay. For some reason now it's not allowing me. There we go. It's, the internet is not here we go here we go i apologize again all right one second i'm going to look at the chat in a second Good. All right. Great. Mm, here we are. Share. Okay. Let me jump back to where we were up to. All right. So as I mentioned here, we have a, a an archaeological... Hold on a second. All right, that should work. Okay, as I mentioned, we have uh, a lot of, we have archeological, never mind that didn't work. Testing. Much better. Okay. So as I mentioned, here we have uh, a, we have a, a historical source that when they dug up over here in Tel Shekhamon and Tel Dar, they very clearly found um, numerous uh, shells from the Mirak Shankulis and the Miris Brandis um, that were found on the Tel, um, which is, as we know, both from uh, Torah sources and from historical sources, that this was the area that they died trellis. Yet we don't find any other shells that over here that were dug up only of Mirak Shankulis. Number seven, the dye of Tchelis is very expensive. As we saw from the Gemara Menachas, and Pliny the Elder writes that the Tyrian Debatha, which cannot be bought for even 1,000 dinara per pound, and Theopompus, which says purple for dyes fetch its weight in silver at the Colophon, which is very, very expensive to, to buy Tchelis. The dyeing process, as we mentioned, uh, as okay, here's where we're up to the dyeing process, or this is where at least I realized that I was um, missing. I was I was not uh, following with you. Okay, um, I just want to catch up on on some of the chat here that someone asked. Um, Who the mayor? That's a great question. I'm gonna try to get to it in a second. All right. Roughly, it took about I would I would imagine about seven years or so till they got there. Um, how do they know to look there? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Are you freezing? Am I frozen? Can you follow? Hold on. Am I frozen, or are you still following with me? I'm following. I'm following. Great. Okay. So uh, regarding the question about how long it took them to get there and how long when they start doing the mitzvah, I don't know the answer to that. 
That's a good question. I'll try to do some research and find out. Okay. The Gemara Menachas Membeis Amibeis says, Amar Leir Abayel Rav Shmuel, Bar Rav Yehuda, Hai Techelta, Hechit Tzivisalei, How do you die? Amar Leir, My sin on Dam Chilazlin, Misamonim, Verimonim, Vehobiyoro, Marsichinle, You put it in, in a pot and you boil it up. Rambam also tells us there's a whole process in how to die. Kitzit and Seivim Tchele Shel Tzivit Shel Tzitzis, Loichin Atzemer, Vachakach Mivin Dam Chilazlin, Venoisin Es Adam Liyora, Venoisin Eimai Samamonim, Kemai Hakimonia, Vichyotzvem, Kederach Shat Seivim Eis Mini. What Rambam is telling us here is that there was a known way to 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 make Tcheles, and this is the way that was widely accepted, meaning that the the dyers knew how to do it. It wasn't like in a uniquely Jewish thing. It was it was done. It was known. And they boiled it up by This is what's considered Tchelis of Tzitzis. Um, in the Asher Book of Dying, what? Yeah, sorry, if, uh, sorry for interrupting. Here's a, here's a $64 question. What does some manan literally mean? Because some translate as herbs, some as spices, and as, and as we do today with uh, salts. So which is it? What does some manan right. actually mean? So as the Rambam just answered your question, however they do it, that's what it means. <laughs> I know that's a cop-out answer because I'm not a chemist. I don't know um, how it's done. But the Rambam is telling us that this, this, the way to make this trailer is a known way to make it. And as we find here, as I, I'm quoting with the next slide, the Ashba work of dying says clearly the miric secretion is mixed with water and, and uh, uh, solubilized with a mixture of sodium hydroxide which is caustic soda or lye and the reducing agent of sodium ditothenate which is um, high, sodium hydro hydrosulfite i apologize to the academic community for my complete botchery of the pronunciation of these words these two ingredients adjust the, uh, the ph of the solution allow the dye to bond to the wool these ingredients are used to standard vat dye 65 and have the identical effect as those used in ancient times which is wood ash so again Rafi, to answer your question, I'm sure what, whichever way it was, you can find better ways to create the same type of dye using using chemicals um, that we have access to today, which would create the same effect. But, uh, some, someone who's a chemist or uh, you know a, a physicist would be able to to identify what that is. That is way beyond my pay grade, so I'm not going to discuss something that I'm clearly not uh, you know um, eligible to discuss. The solution is then boiled and the wool is placed into it for about an hour while continuously being heated. Upon removal from the solution, the wool becomes a brilliant blue. So here's a picture, and here are pictures of the dyeing process, but it's much better in a video, and I have a video that I'm going to show you in a second. Hopefully, you guys will be able to hear the sound on the video. If not, I'll have to uh, explain what we're watching. I don't know if uh, it will route the audio into Zoom or not from my computer. The stages of the dyeing process, from left to right, we add boiling water to the solution, you place the, the wool in the dye, you stir the wool, which turns into a green color, remove the wool, the change from green to blue as, it, as it's oxidized, and, it, and then you hang the finished wool to dye. So as you see here, it's sort of like a yellowish, greenish color when it's inside the solution. Once it comes out, it turns a dark blue, and it, we hang it to dry. I'm going to stop the share now and play the video that I normally uh, show here in my slideshow. So hang tight with me, please. The screen um, and media player here. Okay, share. And not this video. Hold on. Here we go. Actually, stop share. Hold on. It's got to be a better way to do this. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to play the video. Uh, let me know if, if you guys can hear it. I'm just going to play it for a few seconds. Let me know if you can hear. Were you able to hear that? Very yes, little. Yes, no? Very, very little. No, not just a very, very distorted mile of very faint tough. sound. Okay, so I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to talk over it then and explain to him. So here, in the, here he's explaining... Um, how they died in the trailer. What comes out of the snail is a purple color. You take the purple color and you dry it, and that's what that's what this little chemical, which is called dibroma indigo, which is an indical hold on indical molecule, which has two bromine atoms attached to it, and that's the purple color. You fill it up with hot water, 
and then they take you take the dye, you add it in, you make the solution basic, so you add a base, and in order for the dye to bond to the wool, you add a reducing agent. In the ancient world, they would use your old urine, which would give the same reduction that we're able to do today with a chemical. And finally, before you put the wool in, you put in a little acid to make the solution a drop more, a drop more neutral. If we would just put the wool in the way it is now, we're going to end up with a purple color. In order to get the blue color, it needs to be exposed to sunlight. He's pouring some into two different canisters, one which he's going to put in the sun and one he's going to leave um, not exposed to sunlight. He said the shame into stitzes in case anybody was concerned. He put it into that one. He's going to cover one of them so that no light gets on it. Now he's taking this one out and putting it into the sun. When you put the bromo indigo and indigo with two bronines into the solution, you end up with purple. But if you put the same molecule into the solution, but the sun hits it, it breaks the bromine, bromine bonds. And once that's broken, you're left with indigo. And basically, you put everything and expose, uh, expose it to the sun, and it ended up blue. Now we're gonna uncover the the one that was not exposed to sunlight, and you can see the wall is still white. Once you take it out, watch what happens. Once it's exposed to the oxygen, you can see it turn purple. It's, it's incredible. You're just washing it off the acid so you can touch it, but you'll basically see that as the more it's exposed to the oxygen, the, the, the color spreads all over the wall. But as you can see, it's a purple color. Yes, it's available on Vimeo. You can, uh, I'll try to leave a link for it afterwards. You can just search Trelis Factory. Okay, he's going to go outside and get the, now, the other one that was exposed to, that's exposed to, uh, to sunlight. This is the one that was sitting in the sun. And now it's turning blue. He's going to compare the two in a second. You'll be able to watch and see the difference. You can see the difference in the two in the two colors. You can oh. see here the purple and the blue. All right, let me go back to what we were saying before. I always find it fascinating to see the to see how how the process is done. It's it's incredible to see once you pull it out how it change how it changes the color. All right. Getting back to our sugya here, Murek's use ceased to during the same period that Tchelis did, and we're going to see exactly the lineup, both by uh, Torah sources and secular sources as well. So, 
It's important to note that the only sea creature that has ever been documented by historians as, been, as having been used for dye in ancient times is the family of the Amiric snails. Again, I'm going to ask if everybody can please mute their microphones. The Gemara in Erevin tells us that this was such the case that if you were to go to the Shuk and find, uh, and find, um, if you were to go to the Shuk and you would find the uh, uh, find Tchelis strings, can you use it for Tzitzis? Because we know that Tzitzis has to be made Lishma. Amar Rabbi Lazar, Hamaytzi Tchelis Bashuk, Lishaynis Pesulais, Chutin Ksherim. Maishna Lishaynis, the Amar, I dated the Glima Tzivinu. So, we know, as, as we mentioned before, and that, that this, this Tcheles, I'm sorry, this Murex dye was used, uh, uh, this thing that we know as Tcheles was used by both Jew and Gentile alike. It was not a unique thing to the Jews. To, it was unique that Jews wore it in their tzitzis, but it was used in many different types of garments. Therefore, if you found it in the Shuk, you had to know if it was, it was, in, its, uh, if it was in strings, you could assume it was made for the use of Tcheles, and therefore it was kosher to use. Mercer, so when did Tchelis stop being used? Sure. Do you mind, do you mind if I ask a related question? Fine, if I need to in the shuk. So the question sure. I have is, how does that how does that work? For example, if you find if you find a string of Tchelis in the shuk and the guy and it may not have been a Um what I mean, this is more of so a question for Rambam uh, ratio, which is basically half the string, right? It's right, it's right, half half blue, <laughs> half white. So how so so where are you going to find uh, a Tchelis a, a string in a shuk? Where it's only here, it's only half and half. Now, is it now? So that's the question. The answer is that a uh, couple Shmona came later on. The question is, when did a couple Shmona come? It's, it's a, a great question. Um, it, what? I saw an answer once that um, there's a halacha is that if you're if you're you can create a string by tying two ends together. If a string is broken, it's too short. You lots to tie two strings together. So one of the answers that's given to this very question. It's in um. Rabbi uh, in Israel, Rabbi Brand Safer, one of the Sepharim on Tchelis, he says, well, the answer is that you can tie the, you can take the, the full blue string and still tie it to half a white string and still be kosher to be used, according to the Rambam. That's the one answer he gives. Hmm. Well, can you repeat the original question? No, so, no, so my question is, um, with, with, this is more so specific to, uh, to Rambam strings, right? Rambam strings is basically half blue, half white. Right, practically speaking, you're not going to find a guy selling selling in a shuk um, a string that's half blue, half white. You'll, you'll see only whole strings. So how, does, how does that work with, with the Robin ratio? That was my question. You know, whether or not it was done with Shmar or not. And if you and if you're going if you're going to say that mm -hmm. uh, that that, that, that hail strings should be done with Robin ratio, then it's bad than it was, that it wasn't done with Shmar because uh, why why are you, why are you only finding a whole string instead of half the string? Correct. It's a great question. Um, that well, I think we can discuss it more next week when we discuss again how to wear and, and the proofs for and 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 for each shita that we're going to discuss. Honestly, Rafi, I think you can give that share better than me, just from following your post on 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 uh, Facebook. But oh, yeah. I'm sure Bezis Hashem will discuss it. But this is uh let's let's stay within our within our our framework. The the what we're trying to bring within that Gemara is that the Gemara says clearly over there that, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Gemara says clearly that there was, a, it was used for both Jew and Gentile, meaning it, you can't assume that if you found something in Tchelis, it was automatically made by a Jew for Jewish purposes. Uh, we're trying to prove that this was not only historic in only document Demir Shankulis as being used to make such a, uh, these type of garments, but that these garments were also used by Jews as well, because if you found something in the Shuk, you, uh, that was treles, you could use it, as long as it met the criteria. Anyway, the Gemara Menachas tells us that Mar Mashki Aisi Trelta Bishani Ravachai. In the in the times of Ravachai there was still treles around. However, the Gemara in Sanhedrin Dafid Beis tells us a story as follows. Zug Bami Rekes. There was a peer that came from Rekes. Rashi explains that as Tiberio. Vitavsu Nesher and the Eagle caught them. Rashi explains it was a, a, a troop of soldiers, Persian soldiers. Now here you can see clearly the work of the censors, um, because uh, which the, these, the Gemara was originally written in the in uh, or printed in in the in the Germanic lands, which was um, which was uh, called the Roman Holy uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and the censors definitely had their eyes out for things that were blaming the Romans. Um, the Persians were definitely not around in Eretz Yisrael at that time, 
It was the Roman soldiers that were around. What? It's almost like saying the eagle has landed. The top said, "Nasher ubiyadim devar manasa belos." And these zug, this this people that came from Rekes, they had in their hands something that was. Uh, um, they had devar manasa belos. Umayniu, what was it? Tcheles b'schus harachem and b'schus sam yotze b'shalim. So the Gemara is telling us something interesting here that in the schus of the rachamim of 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 Hashem and in the schus of this pair, they they uh, uh, they got out of the encounter without too much of a problem, but. It's interesting to note what's going on here. They were carrying tchilas, and they would have been in serious trouble from the soldiers if not for the schos arachim and their schos. As, so all of a sudden we're seeing here that tchilas is starting to be considered can- contraband. So far we're seeing the timeline. Says the the Medrash Rabba and the Bamidu Rabba says mitzvah lavi lovin b'tchilas v'yaseh emosai when. So already in the times of the Medrash, we're starting to see, we see that there is no Tchelis. The Ramban writes, Already from the times of the Go'inim, they were already going without Tchelis. The Rif says, And the Rama writes, We only have white strings at our disposal. So we see clearly already from the Tkufas HaGa'inim and, and farther on through the Tkufas HaGa'inim, Tcheles was no longer used in Tzitzis. Why? We have to ask why. We saw in the times of, of Rabbi Choy, there were people still using Tcheles. Already in the times of Rava, uh, not Rava, in uh, Zugba Mirakes, at that, point, at that time, there it's already contraband, and ready from the Ga'inim, it's no, longer being, it's no longer in use. Not only is it no longer in use, but we know Tcheles has to last for a long time. So that means the last piers of Tcheles that were still being used had to have worn away to the point where it couldn't be used anymore. That everybody from the Gainim already are wearing only talus that have love and strings. Well, we see here that in the, in the times of uh, the emperors Valentinian, Theodosius, and Arcadius, um, they started to outlaw the use of tcheles, of murex, of parpura, to anybody that was not part of the royal family. And I quote, No private person shall have the power to dye or sell purpure goods, silk or wool, which is called blata, oxyblata, and hyacinthia, which is, which is, uh, Latin, which is Latin for, uh, um, for uh, purpura. And if anybody shall sell cloth of the aform- uh, said murex, he may know that he incurs risk of losing his property and his head. So here we see that the Roman kings put a death penalty on anybody who would wear tcheles or anyone who would wear murex um, not, that was not part of the royal family. Now, in order to demonstrate how serious the, the rulers considered the murex and how, 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 how it was so, such a prized possession of theirs, that they considered royalty, all one has to do is take a look at coins that were minted in that time. And we have to thank Reb Tzvi Rogan of the Old City for this picture. And here he has a whole bunch of different coins that, that have minted onto the coins the Murex Shrunculus. You can see it on the different coins where the arrows are pointing, which is fascinating to note because rulers don't put, you know, cockroaches on their, on their coins. They don't put Horses, I mean, they don't put, uh, they put horses because horses are important to them. They don't put cats on their, on their coins. They put things that were considered of vital importance to them. And here you see that the Miracle Trunculus is on all these coins. It shows that it was a royal thing. It was something considered of, high, of great importance to them. So then the question is, okay, so very good. You told me that in the place where the Romans were in control, um, there couldn't be Trelas because it was a, there was a decree it was it was a uh, it was a decree Xeris uh, Malvis, and we know Yaharik Val Yavar is only by the Gimel of Eris Chamuris, but not by the Mitzvah of Tzitzis. So here's a map of the Roman Empire. As we see, the red circle indicates the area where Chelos is found. The Chelosin is found. That's all within the Roman Empire. So you might ask, okay, but what about people outside the Roman Empire? Well, they couldn't get it because. The only people that were in control of that area were the Romans. And even after the fact, when the Romans 
when the Roman Empire split into the Western and Eastern, uh, which was the Byzantine Empire, it was also continued. That area was still under that that shlita of of the Rome of the Byzantines, which also considered it to be a royal garment. Therefore, eliminating the 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 only source of the tcheles from everybody's hand. Basically, only the royal, only people that were royalty had access to tcheles, which is why already from the times of the Goyim, nobody was wearing tcheles. Not because they didn't want to do the mitzvah. It was just a a complete risk of life to to attempt to even wear tcheles. We see this openly in the Ramban. The Ramban writes, the Chavad of the Sefaris, Shayin Nechbar Mufoyer Bum of Usham, Nechbar Dim Mufarim, Kamisha Amar Kosov, Kechos and Yechayin Per, Ki Ela Begodim Levushe Malchusheim. These clothing are considered royal garments, Kid Musam, Yabusha Malachim is Manatera, that they would wear, that the Malachim wore in this Manatera. That Chelis and the Chelis, Gam Hayoim, also today, La Yarim Ish Es Yada Ilova Ish Chotzmi Melchayim, nobody would dare wear it except for the Kaisha kings. And here we see a picture, a, a painting of Charlemagne and his son uh, Louis the Russia, um, wearing uh, wearing purpura garments. It was a royal garment that nobody would dare wear because out of fear for their life. So it wasn't because that they didn't know. We see clearly the Ramban knew knew that the purpura garments that the kings were wearing was the tchelas, and had he had any opportunity to wear it, he would have wore it. It just it was Xerus Mavis. By the 9th century, the only purple dye works left in, were in Constantinople, and those were controlled by the Byzantine Empire. When, the Constant, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, the secret of dyeing purple with sea snails was lost. Now, why was it lost? This is an actually, actually an interesting thing. The, the Arabs, in general, value very little what they don't need. And especially at that time, when there were already other other uh, ways to create the purple purple dye, they basically destroyed any sort of any sort of ways to continue the 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 production of the muric shrunculus because they're just not something they valued, and they destroyed they destroyed. This is we can see this through many many uh, places in history where as they took over certain areas, anything that, that was not considered valuable to them, they sort of let it waste. Okay, so let's take a look at the timeline. We have, first we're going to go through the the secular timeline, and we're going to match it up with the Gemara. We see that the first restrictions for Tcheles is around the three, year 300. It's still in use, but it's restricted. Um, they're starting to torture those that die Tcheles illegally. Right around the 400s, Theodosius already uh, proclaims that Murek's dying is considered high treason. And Justinian writes that Murek's dying is punishable by death. He specifies Tcheles by name, Hycynthia. And the fall of the, Ro of the East Roman Byzantine Empire in the 1453, as he mentioned. And that's uh, from that point on, you can see in the graph that uh, already from right before the 500s, Tcheles was ceased, and Tcheles was quote unquote Nignas from already the year 700 onward because um, it just was not there was no access to it Rava writes around the year 300s that Tcheles, uh, the trade of Tcheles is restricted right that's the Gemara in um, in in you uh, Sanajan base matching up with the timeline we know that their abundance of rice still had limited Tcheles the Goenim write that Tcheles were non-existent as we saw quoted from uh, quoted earlier the Ramban writes in the 1200s, he writes of the ban on Tcheles, as we just saw. In 1887, the Ritzin Rebbe begins his search for Tcheles, and Tcheles production begins anew in 1988. So here we see the timeline oh. that shows pretty clearly that the when at the same time that the Gemaras are mentioning the lack of Tcheles, Lines up exactly with the same period of a uh, period that the Romans are restricting the Murex use. So to summarize, and um, with this, we'll uh, we're, we're almost finished. We got a few more few more minutes, and I apologize for going going past my uh, my original uh, my original time. In order to maintain, so far we went through we went through 
nine proofs that show that the Miric Shrunculus and the Tcheles are existing in the same times and spheres. So therefore, in order to maintain that the Miric Snail is not the Chilaz and Tcheles, we would have to presume that in the time of Chazal there were two types of snails that both ceased to be used at the same time in history, both were found between Soma de Tzor and Haifa, both were referred to by name as Parfuro, both produced strong dye that does not fade, both were identical to Kala Elan, both can be differentiated by plant indigo only by the fact that the latter fades, both needed to be extracted while alive, both had dye contained in a sac separate from the animal's lifeblood, both were extremely expensive, both were widely used, both by Jews and non-Jews alike, and yet, in order to say that the Miric Shrunculus is not the Tcheles, only one of them is extremely well documented, namely the Murex, and multitudes of shells and other artifacts have been found, whereas the other one, the Tcheles, has not left a trace for some reason. Only the one we do not have was valid for Tcheles, whereas the one we do not have, I'm sorry, the one that we do have, the Murex, is not valid for Tcheles for some unknown reason. And despite all of these similarities, Chazal never mentioned the twin, the, the, the Murex, that is invalid, and never gave any way of differentiating between it and the valid variation, as they did for Kala Elon. Furthermore, the possibility of a twin is impossible, since we have already shown that the same Tcheles, from the same source, the Gemara and Erevan, as we mentioned, was used by everyone, Jews and non-Jews alike, and there was never a possibility of another type of blue fabric that was not either kosher treles or plant indigo. So this is what we call the bomb, to quote my Rabbi Rabbi Kalaman. In order to, in order to postulate that the Murex Trunculus was not the, is not the chilozen of treles that Chazal used, you would have to go through this most, in, you would have to take such a, a far out chance to assume that it isn't the right one. It isn't the same thing. There's no proof from Chazal. Chazal, don't mention any way to differentiate between it. Don't warn us that, like they warned us with Kala Elon. And if Kala Elon, which is not near La Ayin, the difference for sure, the, the Mirik Shrunkulis is not near La Ayin to what kosher trailers is, quote unquote. And yet there's no right, there's no there's no mention at all. There's no warning, nothing to be said that that the Mirik Shrunkulis is not kosher for trailers, which they would have warned us if there was a reason to be chayshish for that. Elamai, one has to say, one has to go on a very far limb to say that the Mirik Shrunkulis was not the Chilaz and the And even if you would, uh, even if you were to suggest it, you would have to deal with the, the with all the, with all this possibility that with this. The fact is that there was no such other snail that was mentioned at all. There was no other source. The source was always the Murex and the uh, was either the Murex or Indigo. Might Therefore, you for a sec, sorry. Sure, sure. So, so, so let's take for example because this because this topic wasn't even broached uh, the cuttlefish, and there really, I mean, really, I mean, there isn't much to talk about. But but just bringing it out there, what are the chances that maybe chilozin was a general term for for any for any shares yam, such as such as such a snail and a cuttlefish, right? And say and second of all, and second of all, maybe maybe Chazal did, didn't warn about this other type of quote-unquote chilas. Uh, from the cuttlefish, which is which is which itself doesn't produce blue, but that's besides the point. Um, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't bring it up because it was one of those things that just wasn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't one of those things that was easy. That was easy to control. That's second of all. Third of all, uh, lasting for a very long time. The the, the Rambam writes right? means steadfast in its beauty. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to last for for a very long time. So. I'm just I'm just playing devil's advocate. Like like, can any of these arguments be used uh, in favor of the cuttlefish? Okay, so let's break that down. First of all, the Rambam's question is uh, is I think separate from this discussion. And the Rambam is just talking about that the the he's not talking about the 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 life of the strings per se. And he's talking about whether or not the color will run, um, which it which as we know from Yurks doesn't run. From the cuttlefish, it does run. 
So uh, just ask, uh, just uh, just walk into your local Breslov location and buy as many pairs of tchilas as you want for a few shekel and uh, put it in the wash and then come back to me and tell me if it, if it, if it runs or doesn't. Um, I'll tell you one even better. I'll tell you one even better. I, I, have, I, have, I have a pair of uh, scissors with, uh, with rosin or tchilas. I, I did it for, for experimenting purposes. And I didn't even mm-hmm. throw it through the wash. All I did was was untie, was untie and retie, and you could and you could see the differences in, in terms of in terms of uh, color shade, like the color rubs off in your hands without even uh-huh. washing. Just, just all right. Uh, just, just, just yep. that. You don't even need to put it in the wash. Anyway. All right. Terrific. So there we have we answered that question. Regarding your first point is maybe chilazin is a general term for any type of thing. So maybe chilazin means a grasshopper. Maybe chilazin means a cat. Maybe chilazin means a whale. Well, we know what chilazin means because chilazin means is a general term for snails. So unless you can define a cuttlefish as a snail, we don't even have what to start with. You can tra- try saying that chilazin is a general term for anything, but you have to fit it within the framework of what we have, which is that it fits in the framework of a snail. So if you find me another snail, this is where, this is where it would get interesting. Um... This is where we get. This is where it gets interesting. If you were to find another snail, that was that would. Uh, if you were to find another snail that would have, um, the ca- that would be able to produce another dye like this, then we could yeah, potentially have can. a conversation. You can actually. What the, what the Mirix brand is? Uh, so, so besides that, if you want to, if you want to go, go really far off, there's a, there's there's a there's a there's a, mm-hmm. Mirf, a member of the Mirix Mirf, 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 family in Mexico. Uh, I think Pika Papura Pants, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So that's one, and then there's actually another mm-hmm. one. There's a, there's a, there's but there's there are another, there are another part, there are another, there are another subspecies like the ones of Greece. They're, 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 they're within the same family. Yeah. They're not a separate thing. But you also have, for example, in California, you, you actually have a black mirror. It's uh, uh, Hexaplex uh, Negriti, I think is what it's called, right? Right, right, right the mm-hmm. Negro uh, snail, right? The Negro Hexaplex snail. So that actually, I mean, I haven't tested with uh, with blue, but I don't see why that can't do blue, blue and purple either. So okay, we well, if you can do it, then we then we can have a conversation. Until that point, I don't. I, as far as I know, there is no. Um, I, I haven't read that deeply into into this fish. I'm not I'm not familiar with it. But to be but fair, it's um, because any because I mean I think I think I heard Rabbi uh, Cheskel Taproch say say mm-hmm. that. Lazon just means a snail. So if you can have, have a snail giving you the desired color, then you're in business. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I hear. Dove. Dove. I, the Be'er Sheva. Uh, first of all, I'd like to see that. Can you send that to me? Uh, referring to Arba Eschilazan. I don't know why, how you'd be able to fit it in. Um, the Arba Eschilazan, just based on the characteristics. The, the Arba has a shell, technically. Um, I hear. Interesting. Interesting thing we can say we can definitely look into that. Well, not chilazin of chilas, obviously it would it would have to be the chilazin of uh, it would uh, chilazin is a general term for snails, right? The whole bali in Ertuk, as it says. Yeah, tzolzol. What is tzolzol? Uh, shell. Okay, so so tzolzol and Ertuk are two different words you're saying. I don't know. Tiltel is the pasuk in Dvarim that's referring to uh, referring to the mm-hmm. land being inherited by the Tzalatzal. Mm. Okay. You brought that in Makor before. It's from the Targum right. Yushalmi, Yushalmi calls it, uh, or maybe uh, maybe it's in, maybe in, in Zeal calls it uh, Chalzoina. So the Beresheva translates that as Arbe. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Beresheva, I, okay. I have it on my computer, but it's the Be'er Sheva on the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Um, again, uh, Your base? The one talking with the Yad Ramah. The same, the same uh, Gemara. Okay. okay. Fine. Send it to me, but um, I'll definitely look into it. Yeah, as soon as I can okay. find it in my mess of notes. <laughs> Thank you, though. Okay. Let's go back to what we said so far. So, so far we're assuming, assuming that we now have successfully pinpointed the chilozin that creates a a dye that is that is uh, that is blue a bluish color 
that is strong and doesn't fade, which the Murex trunculus definitely matches up with all with those, all those criteria. Whether or not we can find an additional snail is irrelevant for this discussion. One thing is for certain that we could all agree on is that the Murex trunculus matches with those three criteria. It's a chilazin. It fits, it fits into the description of chilazin. It produces a blue dye, as you all witnessed. And its color doesn't fade. Says the Rambam, the mitzvah zu shneitzivais. There are three, there are two commandments within the commandment of v'nasinu al tzitzis hakan of psalteles, and not just that, but on the whole mitzvah of tzitzis as well. Shiyasa al kan of anav yotzim imena v'shiyecher chal anav chut tzitzis. There needs to be um, there needs to be a, a string of tzitzis on the tzitzis itself in order for the the tzitzis to be in its ideal way to be mekayim the mitzvah of tzitzis. One is required to have this part of of the tzitzis, both the white strings and the blue strings. Oops. Says Taisis, Mishainu matal tchelis betalisa. Well, he doesn't say these words, but this is what he's referring to. Shatayla kali ilan bevigdai. This is on the Gemara above Metzia. Valaymer tchelis. Someone who puts kali um, ilan uh, on his bigdai and says the tchelis. The ever al mitzvah tzitzis. He's being ever on the mitzvah of tzitzis. That means if someone has the tchelis to wear tchelis and instead puts kali ilan. Or by extension, doesn't put anything at all. He's over on the mitzvah tzitzis. Right? This is, is telling us that it's not enough to just wear a love and he can say, you know what, I'm in the mood, just I'm wearing white strings today. If you have the achilles to wear it and you don't wear it by putting something else on, you're over on the mitzvah tzitzis. Darugasa Baisim, which is one of the Tamidim of the Bali Tesis, writes, Misha Yeleshni Minim, he has love and achilles. Veloi Haya writes a lasa is ki in echad, he only wants to put on one min. Mak and I say we hit him Ashatitsi Nafshay until he is his his he dies basically. He didn't call Mrs. Ase. Pretty strong words from the Ruga Sabis. Says the Lavosh, Chaim Adam Lovash Khalis with Sitzis Bakal Yaim Im Yimsa. If one would be able to find kosher Tchalis, he would be required to wear it on his tzitzis. And the Bisalevi, which is quoted um in uh, I'm sorry, which is in Chelik Alef Simon Bey says, "Mi shi yishle tchelas umata love and bobad over al bal tigra." He's over on bal tigra, meaning assuming you have kosher tchelas again. Fear, let's be fair. If you have the kosher tchelas and you only wear love and bobad, then you're over on bal tigra. If you don't have tchelas, so then you're not over on bal tigra. Same like the Levush says, if you have it, then you have to wear it. If you don't have it, then you don't have to wear it. This is the opinion also of the Svasemis and the Mishnah Baru. So what we're coming out here is that. And this is the end of part one. Next week, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll uh, discuss uh, some of the common questions. What about Mesera, Nignaz, um, Seda, and Shabbos, all the other questions that are basically brought up on what we have so far. But until this point, where we're coming out from, is that if a person is convinced by going through the sources, by looking through what we, what we have been able to produce so far, and to show us and accurately demonstrate that the Mirik Shankulis is Kosher Vertchelis, which we, all have, which we all can have access to, thanks to um, trellis.org and Rafi's website, bluefringes.com. Uh, you're welcome for the plug, oh. Rafi. Um, so you can very easily buy uh, trellis today. Not. Yes. Not. We have a, a visitor that has an argument a little bit. Black okay, guy. one second. I'm going... One second. I'm happy to take the argument in just one second. Um, let me just finish up what I was saying here, and then I'll happily take any questions and talk to whoever wants to jump in. Um, if we can pinpoint, knowing the, uh, knowing with, with certainty that that the Murex Trunculus not only is kosher for trellis, but by by going through all those points that we went through before, was very likely the source, not very likely, probably almost certainly the source that Chazal used for their trellis, and we have access for it, of it today, in order to keeping within the words of our of our place skim, one would be required to wear it on their tzitzis. Again, um, uh, as I mentioned in Akdamba before, we're not here to tell people what to do, how to do it. Everybody has our bottom. You can ask the Shaila, you can look into the Sugi yourself. To quote my Rebbe or Gersha Meltzer, one who listens to a shear on the topic, or listen, thank you, Doe, for sending that. One who listens to the shear uh, to share on the topic or um, reads a book on the topic is not considered going through the Sugya. Learning up the, the Maram learning things that up inside is considered going to the Sugya. A person then can take that information, go to the Rav, can ask whether or not they should be putting it on. But it seems clearly, if we can demonstrate, as we have so far tonight, 
that the, that the Mirik Shrunkulus is a very good candidate for a kosher trelis. One would be, it would seem, one would be required to wear it, and if not, one would be over on Baal Tigra and potentially being over on a Bittal Mitzvah Sasei the Arisa. Thank you for all that showed up today. I don't know if anybody was seeing in the chat, but it looked like we had Ben Shapiro join us for a little bit today. Um, so My life is chat. complete. <laughs> That was that was awesome that he joined. I didn't think he was going to join. I sent it to him, but yeah, he wrote in the chat. Hi, this is Ben Shapiro. Rabbi Q was a good work. It's <laughs> very cute. Um, and Rafi, hopefully the, his picture is coming to your blog. And for those who don't know, Rafi, if anybody here is interested, you can find uh, there's a great resource on Facebook called Chelas Group that's run by Rafi, and um, he also has a great blog called My Western Wall uh, that has all sorts of resources on. Uh, as well. Thank you, everybody who joined us, and now I'm happy to take any questions um, and uh, join. I had a question in the chat earlier. Did you want to address that? Um, yes. You. You. Let me. Let me just check up your your question again. It was a good question, if I recall. How long did it take? I, I sort of answered in the middle. The answer is I don't know. Huh. I read the question. Um, I read the question. Yeah, the, I'm going to read the question. How long did it take from when the Bnei Yisrael crossed the Jordan until they conquered up to the Achziv area? And then how did they know to look there for the only type of snail that would produce tchelis? So the, the probable answer is, is that this was not something new. This was known, uh, as we know, that tchelis was already used in the Midbar. They had access to it probably from Mitzrayim where they, when they took it, when they took it uh, from Mitzrayim when they left. So they probably had a lot of access to Tchelis there because it was a royal garment that was used already then. Um, and how many years would elapse from the time of the commandment to wear a Tchelis fringe until they were actually able to start producing it? That, I can't answer that question either. I don't know. Um, like I mentioned, I'm assuming they, they, they knew what it was either through um, through the words of Moshe Rabbeinu or the other uh, the other uh, Rabbanim that were there uh, uh, from Yeshua or from the, from the Nevi'im. And uh, I think it took about seven years till they got a give or take till that point. Okay, thank you. All right, no problem. Hi, Bobby. Hi, hi, Yehuda. Um, Rashi said on the trellis that it's seven year old. So, what color is it really supposed to be? Rashi said okay. trellis is seven year old. In three places. That's right. Did you see what? Um, did you see the picture? Yeah, I did. It's Tchelet. Right. Tchelet is like blue, right. and Rashi says Tchelet is seva yarok. How do you? So how do you really know what color it really, really is? All right. So it's actually a shade of uh, anywhere from deep dark purple to a bluish green. Um, Meltzer told me that the color is not ma'akev at all. And you can use any color that you like within that framework of what would be considered tres, as long as it's produced in that in that way. So as long as we can we use the the Mirik Shrunkulus and it's produced in the proper way, if it were to make a very light color, that would be kosher. Rafi, you have what to add on this? Yes. Uh, I want to add that, that another member of our fantastic uh, Facebook group, uh, Dr. Stroll Zeidemann, who's been researching uh, this topic since 1969. Uh, suggests that chaos was, was not simply a color, it was a commodity. So purple, blue, light, dark blue, light blue, green, uh, sorry, uh, bluish green, all those colors would fall under the same commodity called chaos. So, so so then the question is, what is Argaman? Is Argaman purple? So according to him, Argaman is actually not, not purple. That's actually um, a pearl, Red. it's actually a reddish purple. Similar to Christopher's in the sack, support by Rishonim. So, so both purple and blue, when it's designed, would fall under the category, the category of Chalas. Like, for example, the shirt you're wearing, Chalas. I could also just add that uh, Rashi in the end of Shalach, um, he, and the end of the Rashi is there, he brings down the Medrash, which says that, that the Chalas is a color which is uh, of the darkened sky, which definitely is not Yarok. So, so the color Yarok also is what Yarok refers to is also kind of ambiguous as well. Well, there is the there is the Medrash Rabbah that says it's Doimel Asavim. Keep that in mind too. Asavim are quite green. Yep. Right. Okay, but remember, in general, Melta, I believe, in a in a share on this talks about it as well. When it, regarding Dami um, Shachar, he says it also 
that first off, I forgot to mention, by the way, that I generally, you know, we had a lot of technical difficulties. Usually, when we get to that slide of the whole basin of of the blood that comes out from the the dam, which is clearly shachar um, when you collect it all. Um, regardless, uh, Rameltzer always said that shach that when when we find colors. None of them are absolute. So shachar is not an absolute black. F F F F F. If you know the hex codes, I think. Um, I think that's uh, black. I'm not sure if it's white or black. I always get mixed up which one is which. Um, I see it runs in my family. My son, whenever he sees something black, he calls it. Look, it's white. Um, so go figure. Um, but it's not a literal um, exactly the, that color. It means it, it means the, a general a general term. So for example. I'm also brought that if you have your 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 ritsuis that are faded and they're not black but they're brown and they're still that brown color that's the natural color of the ritsuis, he holds that you do not have to repaint them because they're not they don't lose their status of being shachar. Shachar just means dark. So all these colors, the color screens, right? Karsi is literal, right? As Parsinan, as we saw in, in in Greek, is a literal green color. But as we know from from those who who learned Masech Nida and did it, just finished it in Davyomi not so long ago, um, that you know when it comes to to what's considered green, yellow is considered green also. So you have all sorts of shades within a certain what's considered a certain color. So yes, you can definitely find trellis that looks like the color of the sea, which is, as I showed that picture of Aksiv, the the sea color, which is, if you would ask someone what color is it, they'll tell you it's a bluish, tealish, greenish color. But it's still under the framework of trellis. Hopefully that makes sense. And it's good to see you, Bobby. I haven't seen you in a very long time. Just for anybody who wants to know, because I know my brother-in-law is here, he's going to be wondering why I'm calling her Bubby. I used to be a Ben uh, Ben Bias when I was learning in Brooklyn by uh, by Shmuley's grandmother. So, uh, who does? Is there any way to get the Marmik Homos you posted? Yes, um, for, uh, there's a safer called Vosha Aaron, which I is basically written by my cousin. Yes, so my entire <laughs> presentation is that. No, I know. As a matter of fact, Mayor Hellman originally. What? On a PDF form? Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I can give you the, the safers in PDF. You don't have it in PDF? No, no, no. I'm saying I want the original Makoros in PDF. Oh, as an actual, like, um, like scanned in, like, yeah, it's yeah, a Chachma yeah, style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, on .org, um, um Barkin has put together all like these Makoros in, in the... Yeah, mm -hmm. you can find it. It's um, one of the PDFs there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. What about the videos? The videos, okay, so if you can't find, I, I, I found it by Googling them. Um, they're mostly put up, posted by the Trelis uh, thing. Uh, on Trelis.org, you can find the video of cracking the shell and searching for the Chilazan underwater and the pre-GoPro -Go stabilization times. Um, I'm hopefully planning on going later once this whole coronavirus moves moves on. I hope to, Bez, as Hashem, go with some uh, with uh, with a few people that should remain nameless and go uh, film over there off the coast to Bezaz Hashem get better footage for that. Did we get an invitation? Um, <laughs> Bezaz Hashem will talk about it. Uh, video, sorry, the the snail searching video I remember was done by was done by a guy looking for looking for a snail group for his uh, for his lunch. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know. Anything. <laughs> yeah, well, it's definitely it's definitely been there, and um, you can definitely uh, you can a lot of the a lot of these resources are on trilis.org, um, so you can definitely look for it there. Um, the specifically the video of him dying in the trilis is I I searched in trilis factory on on Google. I found it on Vimeo, and I just cut out the part that I wanted to show of him dying in the trilis. It's part of a longer video. But that should uh, make it available if you're if you're interested way, in finding that video. The Trellis factory, the, 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 uh, I don't know what they do nowadays, but uh, about five years ago when I went there, um, they told me mm -hmm. that they had the, the way they get their dyes since it's illegal here is they have a guy in Croatia or in Bel Bulgaria, I forget exactly where, who gets the snails, mm -hmm. dyes them, powders them, and sends them back to Israel. 
and they're relying on um, I don't know Chazaka that he's not he's right. not sending anything but the Murex die. So uh, I don't well, know. Well, right now, yeah. right now, the, yeah, I I definitely hear that's a fair point. As uh, for those who don't know, Dove is uh, our big cautious maven, so he's definitely um, attuned to those that don't follow the rules, even though they're supposed to. Um, Pretty sure yeah, Dove Ronan's Dove, also Dove. Kashris, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I call uh, me okay. the Kashris are you? When the guy works for the CRC, it's not really fair. Uh, well, yeah, to be fair, I don't know. I, I can barely hear you. <laughs> Well, Shalom Aleichem. I, I never met Rav David, so this is uh, well, my I, apologies. Well, if I, I, run, I, I, well, I run and run the CRC in Chicago. All right. Well, yeah. nice to meet you. Shalom Aleichem. I didn't Shalom. realize I had the... If I would have known, I would have had you give the share. Um. <laughs> I'm actually planning... Uh, someone actually asked me to give me a share of Zoom uh, in Jackson, for Jacksonville, Florida in a few weeks. So I'm actually... Uh, should be doing a thing also online. So that was definitely Sammy Khan. Uh, it's very huh? That was definitely Sammy Khan. I mean, Good, good guess, though. Good guess. All right. Um, so, so, um, so anyway, to answer your question, first of all, they now have a heksher under Reuben, so you know what that's worth. Um, you can call up Rabbi Reuben and ask him what that's worth, and you can ask him this question. But I know the trailers that I sell, which is um, through Teparovich, which is Chabur Tchelis. I know he deals with it, and he he's he's on top of it from the beginning. So you definitely can uh, can check with him. I'm That's happy to give you their numbers if you'd like to discuss it. Yeah, 